actually, no, we have something else to talk about, which is the health of planet Earth. Uh, I think we have here Fabrice de Klerk from Eat Forum. Fabrice, up on stage you go. Yeah, big round of applause for, for Fabrice. How are Thank you. you. <laughs> How are you, Johan? Nice okay. to meet you. Nice to meet you, Fabrice. Now, you, you're, uh, of course, the head honcho science uh, guy for the EAT Forum. And the EAT Forum, as you know probably in this room, came out a few years ago with the EAT Lancet Commission defining how to eat within the boundaries of planetary and health. Right. Yeah, so, so, the, so the Eat Lancet Commission, published in 2019, was an Oreo cookie, right? We defined two hard shells. What is a healthy diet? And we all realize, as we talked today, that you no know, food is a biophysical need. There's a biophysical limit to how much food we need, what kind of food we need. Mm -hmm. And a second hard boundary on our Oreo cookie, which is not healthy, by the way, is the planetary boundaries, which your famous Swedish compatriot, Johan Rockström, really led the charge on environmental limits that allow healthy societies uh, to continue. The creamy part in the middle of that Oreo, those are the choices that we make today about how do you achieve healthy diets within uh, sustainable limits. And that's where innovation and what you guys are talking about becomes quite, quite critical. Yeah, no, and I think I do remember the report because it came out and suddenly everyone said, like, oh, can I eat more than, you know, just a, a tiny little hamburger a week? Or how much was like it? That. What, was, what, was, what was the limit? I think the limit was, was it... 20 grams a day or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the upper limit for red meat was 20 grams per day, but I prefer to use a, a weekly average, right? So if you're talking about food, uh, animal source foods, it's one serving of beef per week, zero to 400 grams of poultry and per week, zero to 700 grams of, of fish per week, and zero to 175 grams of, of eggs per week. So we're talking about one serving of red meat per week, two servings of poultry per week, two to three servings of, of fish per week. And so there's really quite a bit of range. And of course, vegan or vegetarian can be healthy, but flexitarian is within that range as well. So not yeah, bad, no, 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 you've no, got so the numbers yeah, right. Yeah, I know, no, I still remember them. No, but it, it's interesting because it's, it's, I reflected upon those many times, not the least since I started with this healthy thing that I, we just described, right? Because uh, apparently I need to eat way more proteins and way less carbs, mm. at least the, the, the easy to digest carbs that we have today and um, and which which of course is another another part of the problem because if if the people on planet earth needs to start eating more proteins in order to get healthy uh, th then we're then we're back in the same problem at least if we're eating the same proteins as before <laughs> so so we need to do something about that too but now I mean like you, you're kickstarting the next gen Eat Lancet Commission now. You're here in Stockholm in order to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just, just today, we have our 25 new commissioners meeting at the Stockholm Resilience Center, 10 minutes away, and we're, we're kickstarting Eat Lancet 2.0. So we've realized that despite the first commission, despite the impact it's had, we're still very much off track. Food is still 80% of biodiversity loss. It's 30% of climate change. Two billion people struggling with hunger and malnutrition. Two billion people struggling with overweight and obesity. 8 billion people on the planet soon, more than half of the planet is not successful in exceeding a healthy diet. And that is a, a major, major problem. That is amazing. So, so, so uh, of course, hard to, to look into the future and, 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 and think about what you will achieve. But, but wh when you start this, when you get everyone together, they reflect upon the work that's been done before. What do people say? You know, so we, we should think more in these lines or that line. Yeah. Yeah, so, so again, we think the dietary guidelines are, are, were right. You know, those will, those might be revised a bit uh, based on, on new evidence. The same thing with the environmental limits, we're gonna use the same ones. We're gonna add biocides, antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, insecticides as a critical biosphere limit that we didn't touch in the first commission. And we're gonna dive a bit deeper into the solution spaces. So one of the key issues with the first commission was that we categorized meat as either sustainable or unsustainable, but there are production practices that can be regenerative, right? We can raise live livestock, we can produce fish in a way that is nature positive, and that, that's what we're going to spend more time speaking to. And the second piece is, is dietary diversity, right? So, so the fundamentals of how much you should eat between food groups remains quite solid, but there's a diversity of ways that you can do that. There's a Mexican variant, there's a Vietnamese variant, there's a Swedish variant, there's a Belgian variant, less French fries or less Belgian fries for the Belgians. <laughs> But we need to, to remind people this is about flexibility, it's about choice, it's about deliciousness. There's a variety of ways to get there, but you have to stay within 
the caloric amounts, the caloric ranges that we mm -hmm. speak to, and also within the proportions of the major food groups, which is part of what your committee has been talking about. Hmm. Wonderful. So, so how how do you think? W w by the way, when will this come out? This this will be out in 2024. So we, we're just starting now. It's our first meeting today. Fall 2024 will be the next iteration. That's five years after the first publication, and it's halfway between the Sustainable Development Goals. Right. So the global community has set 2030 as a time limit for achieving Sustainable Development Goals. This will be a halfway mark, an opportunity for us to say. How far has food gotten in this? And, and we really realize, I think many of you do, is that food is so central to so many of those goals that we really want this to be uh, an alert and a warning to how far have we gotten and how much further we need to go. And, and unfortunately, the indicators today is that we're, we're continuing to slip rather than uh, making progress. I think this is so, so vital that we bring this up because you, you talk about the food, uh, the Atlantic Commission 2.0 coming out 2024, six years left. Uh, or if it's in the end of 20, it was like five, five, year, years, five years, five years. Left. years. Okay, um, that's an awful short period of time. What do we need to start doing in the meantime? Yeah, yeah so, so I think there's, there's tremendous opportunities. One, healthy food is just such a no-brainer, right? I mean, ra raise your hand if you're opposed to healthy foods. Right. It's been a tremendous, I get opposed to healthy foods, <laughs> oh my god. I, I mean, it's been such a, a, a powerful tool to get people around the table. And, and even those who were major detractors, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people concerned, particularly with the animal production community, when we've been able to sit down with them and explain what their role is in healthy diets, what their role is in gen production, we really begin to unpack where the innovations can be. And I think we need to move from that dialogue space into the action space. And I think that's where the innovations come from. And the major innovations are how do we help people to, by default, access, choose, afford healthy foods? Two, how do we reduce food waste and loss? Three, how do we improve production practices so that agriculture is no longer degrading environment? but regenerating environment. And here I, I want to emphasize that the world's biggest ecosystem is not Brazilian rainforest, but it's agricultural ecosystems. And this is a space where we as humans have a history of manipulation, of engaging, of moving species around, of, of using tools. We need to be innovating those tools which allow us to store more carbon in soil, store more carbon uh, in crops, improve water quality, leave space for biodiversity, including those species which pollinate the crops that we need to eat. And so I think agriculture ecosystems as a space for innovation is really a major point of emphasis that I hope this community is going to take on. That's interesting because y y last time around you, you came with recommendations for how much to eat, the various things. Perhaps we should come with recommendations on how much to invest in certain areas yeah. going forward. Uh, that, that, I mean, that, that's not a bad idea. So, I mean, the European Union, 40% of the budget goes to agriculture. 6% of that goes to environmental objectives. And so the majority of our public funding goes to produce foods which are neither healthy nor sustainable with only 6% to support that change. So it's not about even new investment, but redirecting investment to those objectives. And I think that that's, that's for me, a major surprise. And that you know, we, we have the tools, we have the smarts, we have the innovation, but we're really missing, I think, the, the willpower to begin to make that investment and really to focus on those, those innovations. But how can we achieve that willpower? Is this a political issue or is it the... <laughs> It's down again to philosophy uh, or th there's, I mean, so there's quite a big political issue, right? There's a lot of vested interests that, that are in, in agriculture and food to start with. But I think that when you realize just how dramatic climate change is, just how dramatic biodiversity loss is, and just how dramatic unhealthy foods are, right? 25% of the U.S. population is at risk of diabetes. That's 25%. 25% of the U.S healthcare budget goes to the food. So when we begin to speak to public health, we say, you know, your, your partners in agriculture are investing public funds in making the foods that you as public health and have to use public funds to resolve. That there's just no coherence. You know, what we produce and what we consume are completely malaligned. And this is, this is a, an abuse of, of public funding. And so I think the first thing is really to realize that reshifting those investments can solve both environmental issues and public health issues. And that we need to have much more coordination or at least alignment between those different policies. And, and climate really is, uh, is, is at risk here. When we look at climate, when we look at COVID, we look at you know, conflict in Ukraine, 
we're seeing this lineup of major conflicts, major challenges that are, we thought was just, okay, COVID, three years, then we'll move on. What we're seeing is just conflict after conflict after conflict lining up. And unless we really begin to, I think, hunker down and begin to think critically about how do we transition, I'm afraid that that's going to be business as usual for, for many of us. I think this is an, uh, another topic here that we need to talk about, Fabrice, is that so people, uh, I, I'm sure you have experienced as well. I have for sure experienced being, you know, you know you're a scaremonger, you know, this is not going to happen. <laughs> look at my fine farm here, et cetera. But what does it look like out there uh, from the expert perspective? Is it better than we think or is it a lot worse than we think? So, so I'm, I'm an, an optimist by nature, but, but I, I have to uh, admit that I, I am quite preoccupied, right? You know, when we saw the conflict in Ukraine, India rose at 10 and said, no worries, we have surplus production will take care of, of what we're losing in Ukraine. Two weeks later, we had uh, three weeks of major heat stress in India. India now has closed its borders to export and says, no, we actually don't have that. And so the resilience of our food system is really in question. And I think we're, we're beginning to see that the, the consequences of climate are interacting with, uh, with conflict. When we look at where mortality was on COVID, the majority of COVID mortality was people struggling with obesity and dietary health. So, so healthy diets and COVID are also interacting. And we're seeing these major challenges begin to interact and create even more impressive challenges. And that, I think, is going to require a much more systemic approach in order to, to address them. And so I think the main point here is that any work that you all are doing to transition towards healthier diets is a major preventative cur cure, not just a preventive action, not just for health, but also for climate and also for conflict. And I think we'd be much better about these kinds of preventative actions. Mm, wonderful. Y you, you coined the term uh, anthropocene. Yeah. Uh, you have to first, uh, I, I guess, explain anthropocene and then anthropocene. Right, right. Sure. So, so jo Johan Rockstrom and many others have coined the term anthropocene, right? So it recognizes that we've now entered a new geological era. Geological eras are, are very long time periods with planetary scale impacts. But that this geological area, the Anthropocene, is driven by humanity. The biggest signal that we see in the geological record I is us. And no other species has ever uh, had that kind of scale of impact. And I think what's important about that is realizing the decisions that we make today have that scale of impact. We used to be able to talk about localized environmental challenges. Now we're talking about planetary environmental challenges. That's the scale uh, of our actions. And so every decision that you make I think it's important to begin to think about it. Well, wh what would this mean if it was scaled up? I, I like the term Anthropocene because quite often where I work in biodiversity, climate, and food, I have my colleagues at FAO that says, Fabrice, you have to choose. It's either food security or climate security. And I think that that's a non-starter. There is no way that we can say either we feed the world or we make the world climate safe. We have to have a world that is climate secure, food secure, nutrition secure, biodiversity, environment secure, and livelihood secure. And we have to stop thinking that it's one or the other. We have to begin to think about how do we do, how do we address the ands that are between that? And I think that you as innovators are actually quite good at that. And that, that's actually the source of many innovations. When you say that climate security and food security are equally non-transgressible, that forces you, it constrains you to say, if this is my constrained space, how do I deal with it? How do I innovate? And so for me, I think that the important part behind Anthropocene is to say, constrain yourself with the ands and use that as a means of discovering the new innovations and technologies. And so for many of you who might be working on, on really specific innovations, what I would urge you and plead you to do is to, as you work on those, take a moment and ask yourself, how does innovation impact climate? Is it going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Is it going to store greenhouse gas emissions? Is it going to improve water quality? Does it help to create more space by biodiver for biodiversity, by either leaving more space intact or by bringing it into agricultural fields? Does it improve livelihoods? Ask yourselves about these ands, and I think it helps you then to contextualize your innovation and being able to then articulate even what its contribution is both to a specific objective but also to, to global objectives. Okay, wonderful. So the and Thropocene will drive the development going forward. Uh, it'll drive innovation uh, yeah. for this uh, new era. Okay, lovely. Okay. Thank you so much for coming, Fabrice. Thanks, sir. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Johan. Pleasure to see you. you all. Big Thank round you of applause you. for Fabrice. Uh, okay, we actually have a short break now again for me on stage. Uh,